the kingdom of God. In the Lord's Prayer, we talk about the kingdom of God, don't we? And, and you know, the world today, much of the world today, will, will have said these words. Um, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. And then later on in the prayer, for yours is the kingdom. So in the Lord's Prayer, we talk about the kingdom of God, don't we? So it's that that we're going to be thinking about. Um, so the kingdom of God then is what we're going to be uh, is what we're going to be talking about. So, so what is the kingdom of God? First of all, well, if we were to go to Psalm 145, we would read these words, and this is from the the New King James Version: "All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom, talk of your power, to make known to the sons of men his his mighty acts, and the glorious majesty of his kingdom." Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures, endures throughout all generations. Now, I'm not going to give you extra points for guessing which words jump off the page there to tell us something about the kingdom of God, because I've highlighted them already, as you can see, in, in bold. So, so what we recognise there straight away is that the kingdom of God is going to be glorious and it's going to last forever. OK, so so that jumps off the page there for us, doesn't it? Right. Well, I guess I guess you all know something about this um, dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. That's in Daniel chapter two, where we we read about this. And um, Nebuchadnezzar has a has a dream um, and, and he dreams about an, an image, a massive image being uh, set up on, on the plane there. And and the head is of gold, and the the chest and the arms of, of made of silver, the belly and thighs made of brass, legs of iron, and then feet part iron and part clay. And then what happens is a a stone is cut out of a mountain without hands, and it comes down the mountain, smashes the image on its feet, the image falls over, and then the stone grinds the image to powder. That's what happens in this dream. And Nebuchadnezzar, of course, doesn't understand this dream, dream at all. So, so he calls all his wise men together and says, tell me what my dream was and, 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 and tell me what it means. And, of course, his wise men weren't able to, to do that. They couldn't, they couldn't recall what, what Nebuchadnezzar had dreamt. And they were all going to be put to death because they wouldn't do what Nebuchadnezzar asked. Um, but anyway, Daniel came to the rescue. Daniel was called for and, and he was Daniel was given the um, the dream by the almighty God. And it was explained to Daniel by God what the dream meant. And so Daniel was then able to explain it all to Nebuchadnezzar. God had given Nebuchadnezzar this dream. What God said was that Nebuchadnezzar was the head of God. Uh, and, and Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was the head of the Babylonian um, Empire. And uh, and he was told that after him, there'd be another empire. So his, his empire wasn't going to last forever. There would be another empire um, and it would be the Medes and Persians who came next. And after the Medes and Persian Empire, there would be another empire, the Grecian Empire. And then after the Greek Empire, there would be the Roman Empire. And then after the Roman Empire, well, it gets a bit harder after that because the, the next empire is, is a bit messy, really, because it's part, part iron and part clay. And, and the Bible tells us partly strong and partly broken. Well, we'll, we'll have a look at some of the words. Um, and, and here in Daniel 2, it says this, as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. OK, now that hasn't happened yet. What, what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream and what Daniel interpreted the dream for him um, to mean was that after Nebuchadnezzar's empire, 
the Babylonian Empire. There will be the Medo-Persian Empire. That happened exactly as God said it would. The Grecian Empire, that happened exactly as God said it would. The Roman Empire, that happened exactly as God said it would. But the last empire, that's not quite happened yet. Um, a mix, partly strong, partly broken, not one empire ruling the majority of the world. Well, I guess that's that's where we are today, isn't it? Um, we haven't got one empire ruling the whole ruling the whole world, have we? So, so the next question is: We know about the the kingdom of God. Where's it going to be then? Well, there's a few times this passage occurs in our Bibles. I brought up this one in Numbers chapter fourteen. Where, where God says, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. So, so the kingdom of God is going to be on earth and the whole earth is going to be filled with the glory of God. So what we know, we learned this earlier, didn't we? The kingdom of God is going to be glorious. It's going to be everlasting. And now we know it's going to be on the earth. Lots more, though. It's not just that. Um, Nebuchadnezzar's dream we've looked at um, in, in Luke chapter one, we're told there and, and everybody knows these words, don't they? Talking about the birth of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we read these words in Luke one. He, this is Jesus, shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So you can see how it's all tying up now, that this kingdom that's never going to end is going to have a king who's going to reign, and that king is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And right back in the Old Testament, when God was speaking to David, um, God said to David, your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Well, the kingdom of Israel didn't last forever, did it? The kingdom of Israel came to an end when it was defeated by the Babylonians. Um, but the Lord Jesus Christ is a descendant of King David from the tribe of Judah. And what, what God was speaking to, uh, about there when he's speaking to David was that one of the descendants of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, would reign over the kingdom of God forever. It's all the Bible is telling us the same thing all the time. So some more passages from scripture that, that help to tell us a bit more about the kingdom. Uh, and this time it's where whereabouts is the capital of this new kingdom going to be? And if we turn to the prophecy of Zechariah, we read we read these words. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. So the almighty God is going to be king and it's going to be the Lord Jesus who acts on the almighty God's behalf as king of God's kingdom on, on the earth. And, and it talks about Jerusalem there in verse 16 of Zechariah 14. They shall even go up to Jerusalem to worship the king. So, so Jerusalem is going to be the capital of this kingdom. Um, and Jeremiah 3 agrees with that too. They shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. That's where the Lord Jesus Christ, as king of God's kingdom, is going to reign from. And, uh, and we get more as well in, in Micah. Uh, so two more books now to look at where they're telling us the same thing. And I like this one, you know, the law shall go forth of Zion and Zion and Jerusalem. Those words are sometimes um, interchanged. Zion is actually the higher part of the city of Jerusalem. So Zion and Jerusalem, it, it's talking about the same thing. The law shall go forth of Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So, so the laws... 
are going to come from Jerusalem and they're going to be God's lot. So they won't be coming out of Parliament in London anymore. It won't be Rishi Sunak telling us what the laws are that we need to follow. Yeah, it won't be President Biden saying what the laws are. It won't even be the European Commission telling us what laws we need to follow. The laws that we will need to follow will be God's laws. And those laws will come out of Jerusalem. And then in Revelation 11, and you've got this quotation in the, on, the, um, on the chart in the, in, the, in the back room. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So, so what we're being told here is what we learnt about, isn't it, from that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. That the kingdoms of the world that existed will all be ground to powder. They won't exist anymore. The only kingdom that will exist will be God's kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ as king. So I suppose we'd ask the question, won't we? Well, well, how can Jesus be king of the kingdom? Because he was crucified and, and after he was crucified, he was he was raised up from the dead back to life. 40 days later, he went up into heaven to be with the almighty God. So how can he be king of the kingdom if, he, if he's not here anymore, if he's in heaven with the almighty God? Well, in, in Acts chapter one, we read these words. And again, it's words I think you will probably know. The disciples were um, looking toward heaven as Jesus went up. And two men stood by them in white apparel. They were, they were angels. And um, they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Pretty clear that, isn't it? Jesus is going to come back again to the earth. He's gone to heaven, but he's going to come back. Just like you saw him go to heaven, he's going to come back again. And, and just a couple of chapters later there in Acts chapter 3, when, when the apostle Peter is, is talking, um, he says these words to the, to the Jewish people who were, who were listening to him there in Jerusalem. He says to them, repent and be converted that he, God, may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things of which God has spoken. So he's gone to heaven. Yeah. But, but he's going to come back again at the time of restoration of all things. God is going to send him back i quite like the first letter to the thessalonians because it's really positive you know about the return of the lord jesus christ and uh, i've just picked out five verses uh, one verse from each of the five chapters in paul's first letter to the thessalonians and in every chapter it talks about the return of jesus christ to the earth so there we have in, in chapter one to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, waiting for Jesus to come back. And, and then it talks about rejoicing. I mean, that's great, isn't it? This is not a time to be sad about. This is a time to, to rejoice about, rejoicing in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when? At his coming, when he comes back. Uh, chapter three talks about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter four, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. What will happen then? Then all those people who have died, who have fallen asleep, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, will be raised back from the dead, first of all. There it is in, in chapter four of First Thessalonians. And then finally in chapter five, may you be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every chapter, it talks about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? How wonderful is that? 
So when's it going to be then? Um, well, I'm not going to give you the date um, because none of us know what the date is. So what, um, what we're going to do to try and find out when this might be? Well, God does tell us about future events in our Bible. See, lo lots of prophecies that God has made have come true already. And, and we've looked at that prophecy about Nebuchadnezzar, haven't we? Um, about the Babylonian Empire and then the other empires following after. And, and all that happened exactly as God said um, they would. Lots of other prophecies as well. Um, God also tells us things about what is going to happen in the future from today. So what can we learn to understand when Jesus is going to return? Well, we're going to think about the prophecies about Israel and, and the Jews. We were told that Jerusalem would be taken and we were told that the Jewish people would be scattered throughout the world. And of course, we know that happened. We we're told that Jews would be persecuted continually. And they still are being, aren't they? E even now in the news, we hear about the anti-Semitic behaviour that's going on in the world the labor party have had tremendous trouble with that over the last couple of weeks haven't they it's still happening the jews are still being persecuted god said that the nation of israel would not be completely destroyed there haven't been other nations in the world as tiny as israel was that have been dispersed and then come back together again as a nation have they? it's absolutely exceptional this you would have thought that that the jewish nation would have died completely after ad 70 when they were scattered through the world but but they haven't been the jewish people maintained their identity didn't they as jews and we know that the jewish nation was established again um, and, Jesus, and God said that they would be. He said that they would return to their own land. So they wouldn't set up somewhere else like in America or, or in the UK or, or anywhere else. They would return to their own land and they would be established as a nation again. And, and we're told also that they would recapture Jerusalem. All this has got to happen before Jesus comes back. <clears throat> well, we know that Israel did become a nation again in 1948, and, and that's a, a a bit of a grainy photo of when David, David Ben-Gurion, who was the prime minister, then the first prime minister of the new Israel, he publicly pronounced the, the start of the state of Israel. And that was on May the 14th, 1948. So that's when Israel was established again as a nation. God said they would be. He just didn't tell us exactly what the date would be when, when they would be established as a nation. But he said that's got to happen before Jesus comes back. He also said that the Jewish people would return to their land. Well, well this is how the Jewish people have returned to their land since 1948. There were just over a million people there in 1950, a million Jews. And, and there are now, in 2022, over 7 million Jews in Israel. They have gone back to the land of Israel just as God said they would. And now 50% of Jews in the whole world are living in the land of Israel. So what about Jerusalem then? Because God said that uh, Israel would take possession of Jerusalem as well. Well, in AD 70, we know that they lost Jerusalem, didn't we? It was destroyed by the Romans and um, it was conquered again then in AD 614 by the Persians. It's been under Muslim influence for a long, long time, um, incorporated into Turkey in 10,000. Then we had the Crusader Kingdom, the Ottoman Turks, and all, all of those were Muslim um, peoples. And uh, you might know of this one. In AD 1917, Jerusalem was captured by the British. I've got a frog in my throat now. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Um, Balfour, you remember the Balfour Declaration? That happened back in 1917 when um, Balfour said it, that the land would be um, would be used by uh, the land of Israel would be um, for the people of Israel once more. And in 1948, when Israel was set up as a nation, um, Jerusalem was annexed by the Arabs. So, so they had a nation of Israel in the land of Israel, but they didn't have Jerusalem. Jerusalem was annexed by the Arabs. And then in 1967, in the Six Day War, Israel captured Jerusalem. And, and you'll probably know if anybody been to Israel. Yeah, a few people been to Israel. Um, at the moment in Israel, um, that there are different uh, religions, aren't there? And and there are Israel, the city of Jerusalem is in quarters. There's the Jewish quarter. There's a there's a there's a Christian quarter. There's a Muslim quarter. Um, so so they haven't got complete control of the land of um, of the city of Jerusalem yet. Um, they're overseeing it. They're, they're in, they've got military control over it. They've got security control of it, but they don't. It's not just the Jewish people who are, are living there, not the Jews who are living there. <laughs> in 1980, Israel made Jerusalem its capital city. But the world, of course, never recognized that at all. They said that uh, Israel couldn't do that. You know, the capital of Israel is, is Tel Aviv and, and they couldn't change it. Um, it was in AD 2017 when that rather nice gentleman, Donald Trump, decided that uh, Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. And he moved the U.S. embassy, didn't he? You remember that? He moved the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, declaring that um, Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. So right up to date there, aren't we? So this is what's happening to um, what's been happening to Jerusalem over that time. Not sure what that's about. Ah, well, we read these words, didn't we? <clears throat> when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Uh, those were words that we didn't read, actually. Verse 20, we didn't read. Um, this was talking about AD 70. This was what was going to happen in AD 70. Uh, but then in 20, in verse 24, which we did read, we said it said Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, Gentiles had complete power over Jerusalem from 19 from AD 70 to 1967 when Israel took it over again. So so I think, but I'm not absolutely certain that verse 24 of Luke 21 is talking about 1967. The reason I'm not certain is that because Jerusalem still has non-Jews living there who, who still have a right to be there. And we read these words, didn't we? There will be signs in the sun, in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, the distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. These words, I mean, this is like our day today, isn't it? Men's hearts failing them from fear and expectations of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And in verse 11, we, we, we read, didn't we, about wars and rumours of wars. Um, distress of nations and when you think about this you know it's, it's it's pestilence really this is talking about no way out is 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 what the words mean a real problem with no way out and, and you know I've, I've, it's not very many years ago now is it when when covid happened nobody could see a way out could they nobody could see a way out of covid it was just killing people wasn't it with all the medicines we have nowadays we couldn't do anything with it could we it's just a blessing that uh, that the vaccine was produced that uh, that enabled covid to be controlled but oh 
there may be another one like that. And these things happening is a sign of the times that the return of the Lord Jesus is near. Men's hearts failing them from fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. What are the other things that are going on at the moment that cause us so much um, grief? We're wondering, and George and I were talking earlier, why don't we get snow anymore? We used to have snow this deep when we were young. Global warming is, is just the, the, the state of um, the world because of climate change. It's just changing dramatically, isn't it? And, and the focus now, and it certainly wasn't when I was young, the focus now is what can we do to try and stop the effects of climate change because it's going to be devastating for our descendants. Definitely something for us to be very concerned about. But also Jesus was telling us here in Luke that these dreadful things um, were going to happen before he comes up. And he said we to, to look up and lift up our heads because our redemption draws near. The time is getting, getting close. <clears throat> we're going to have a look a little bit now at... Uh, a chapter in the prophecy of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, where we're told there that Jerusalem is going to become a real problem. Um, all the nations of the world shall be gathered against it, it says in verse 3. Uh, and when we read Zechariah 12, there are two different Hebrew words that, that are used in Zechariah chapter 12. We have a, a Hebrew word which means a tribe. And, and another Hebrew word, which means a nation. And the first half of Zechariah chapter 12 is speaking about tribes coming against Jerusalem. And in Psalm 83, we're given the details of the tribes that are being spoken about. And, and it's all these ones, um, the tents of Edom. Uh, notice it's the tents of Edom. So it's the people who are living in Jordan who are living in tents. It's the Palestinians who moved to Jordan when um, when Israel was set up as a nation and they've got slightly more permanent accommodation now but not much better than than the tents the Ishmaelites Moab Hagarines Gebel Ammon Amalek Philistines inhabitants of Tyre um, and Asher as well um, which is probably talking about the Hezbollah there in southern Syria so if we put that on a map um, you can see here I don't know that you can see my mouse can you see my mouse just about. We've got the kingdom of Israel here in blue. And then we've got the kingdom of Judah here in purple. So that's the, the land of Israel, the kingdom of Israel plus the kingdom of Judah. And all the other places that are mentioned there in Psalm 83 are all the tribes that are all the way around the land of Israel. And of course, Philistia, Gaza is where all the problems are at the moment, isn't it? Well, we've got problems from there, but we've got lots of others joining in as well, haven't we? The people, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon and Syria causing problems for for, for um, Israel too. So all the peoples round about. This is, this is Psalm 83 that's being spoken about. And we could argue, couldn't we, that, that actually this is the time we're in at the moment. Although Israel certainly have had problems from the tribes round about even since 1948, haven't they? But we're told in verse 6 of Zechariah chapter 12 that, that the people round about will be devoured. So these tribes who are trying, trying to wipe Israel off the face of the map, they won't succeed because Israel is going to win the battle against her neighbours. Then we come to the different word in, in Zechariah chapter 12. 12 and verse 9 god will seek to destroy all the nations that come against jerusalem so it's not talking about the tribes anymore it's talking about the nations it's a different phase of the war in the middle east so not the neighbors now but but the nations and i think it's talking about the nations that are mentioned in another prophecy a prophecy by ezekiel um, and in chapter 38, when it talks about these people coming against the land of Israel, Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Persia, 
Ethiopia, Libya, Goma, and Togoma. And if we looked on a map, that's where those nations are. So, so it's primarily Turkey and Russia in the north with Iran or Persia over there on the um, on the east, and then from, from the south, Sheba and Dedan, Ethiopia and Putin. Um, so, so those are the nations that are going to come against Israel. So what do we what do we know about this then? Well, Israel will have been weakened by the battle with all the tribes, won't they, round about, with all their neighbours. They're weakened from that battle, and then all these other nations, primarily Turkey, Persia, Iran, Russia, are going to be coming down against Israel once Israel have been weakened. And um, Zechariah 14 tells us, um, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. So Israel is going to suffer. When Russia and Turkey and Iran come against Israel, Israel is going to suffer. But it's then, it's then that the Almighty God will go and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And I guess we're all thinking, well, how does God fight in the day of battle? And, and there are lots of things that we could think about, aren't there, about how God fights in the day of battle. Um, my favourite one is... Um, is when Sennacherib comes up against Jerusalem from the Assyrian army and he's got 185,000 hardened soldiers with him to come and take Jerusalem. 185,000 soldiers. <clears throat> and one angel in one night destroys them all. And in the morning, famous saying, they wake up dead. Yeah. So... So the weapons of war against the almighty God, they're just nothing, aren't they? They're just nothing. Not something at all for us to be concerned about how God might, uh, might deal with them, um, with the nations that come, come against his people and his land. Well, we're told half of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The Jews are going to be humbled, but a residue or a remnant will be saved from this destruction is what we're being told there in Zechariah. And then we're told in verse four of Zechariah 14, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Now, this is interesting because when Jesus ascended into heaven, where did he go up from? The Mount of Olives. Absolutely right. He went up from the Mount of Olives and the angel said he's going to come back in the same way that you saw him go up. And he's going to come back and his feet are going to be there on the Mount of Olives. And uh, and there's the Mount of Olives. Um, it's a bit of an old picture, that. Um, but uh, anyway, you can see where it is and. And, and and the Mount of Olives is going to be split in two. Um, so so a straight line down the middle of that that, that uh, picture there, and and half of the mountain is going to go north, and the other half of the mountain is going to go south. Um, so what's going to happen then? A bit of a summary of what's going to happen. <laughs> Israel's neighbours are going to be defeated by Israel, but Israel itself is going to be weakened by, by the battle, maybe the battle that's going on now. Nations are going to come against Jerusalem and take half of it. The Jews then, were told in Zechariah, will acknowledge that they are dependent on God. You know, and that's very different from where they are at the moment. The Jews think they're doing everything themselves. They don't give any credit to the almighty God for helping them through the battles. 
not even in the Six Day War they did. They thought they'd done it themselves, didn't they? Uh, we we know different, of course. But the Jews now will acknowledge their dependence on on God. Jesus is going to come back, and then we're told in Zechariah twelve the Jews will recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They never have, have they? Only just a few Jewish people have done that. They then are going to recognize that the man that their ancestors put to death 2,000 years ago, that he actually is the Messiah and that God will fight for Israel and God will save his people. And then Jerusalem will be God's world capital with Jesus as king, no other kingdoms existing in the world at all, uh, and Jerusalem will be the capital of that uh, of that kingdom, will be the seat of government, and people will go to Jerusalem to worship. And Jerusalem will be a city of peace. Well, we we sang about that in our last hymn this morning, didn't we? Which was which was rather nice. So, what's life in the kingdom going to be like then? Um, many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his way so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they tra train for war anymore. We know these words, don't we, Jim? And, um, and the US still use these words, don't they? Um, about swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. And um, the question for us is, is one that Jesus poses, really, in, in Matthew 25. Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. God offers us a choice. The decision is entirely up to us. Do you want to be there in the kingdom, in a perfect world, with the Lord Jesus Christ as king? Thank you.